It's a pleasure to be here and to have been invited to uh, present some of my thoughts and reflections on the contributions that Lisa Cahill has made to me and my work. <laughs> some of us or some of our family members have had the experience and often still do experience occasions of exclusion where inclusion ought to hold sway. The family is a site where ideally all members, spouses, children, siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, in-laws, and cousins are included in mutually enriching love, activity, and space. The Christian family occupies a unique role in outreach beyond bloodlines that includes all members of the church as sisters and brothers, all of us as children of God. I am interested in inclusion as a matter of policy, especially for our ecclesial and social spaces in matters related to persons with disability and other underrepresented communities. The Oxford English Dictionary defines include, first with a transitive verb, having a rather negative sense of shut of enclosure or confinement, to put or keep a person or thing within bounds, to surround, to shut in, and the like. By the eighth entry in the OED of the verb form, include, the definition takes on a personalist meaning to involve the person in an activity, situation, etc., The noun inclusion is defined as the action or act of including someone or something, the fact or condition of being included, or an instance of this act. The noun is further specified by, in its final entry, the action, practice, or policy of including any person in an activity, system, organization, or process, irrespective of race, gender, religious, age, ability, comma, et cetera. The more I am aware of the spaces where I, wherein I live, work, play, and pray, the more I find myself looking around for who is there and who is not. This looking around is one of the measures I use to get a sense of the crowd to identify my own social references and where I stand literally and figuratively among those gathered. Part of this exercise betrays my own insecurities of belonging and my own internalized oppressions. But the more important part lies in a desire for diversity in the kaleidoscopic manifestations in human and other li living beings and the kind of observe and the kind of diversity observable in our landscapes of the hallmarks of God's manifold creation. As I survey these spaces, I note the composition of those gathered. When the space is filled in monochrome, a certain indignation rises in me and questions of organization, policy, and unexamined privilege occupy my thoughts. Monochrome fails the test of inclusion as it betrays the diversity of God's own handiwork in humankind. While I am not suggesting deliberate intentions to restrict participation of a broader representation of people, belonging to the non-dominant communities, I am suggesting that the status quo is insufficient to meet the requirements of inclusion in the 21st century with a welcome of participants irrespective of race, gender, religion, age, and ability. Among those gatherings, I focus first on ecclesial contexts and second on our social contexts. We Christians have received a unique revelation about the God we worship and adore. The Trinity reveals relationality as one of the ways in which inclusion, central to God's own being 
in God's self and for us is perfected. Divine relationality in se and ad extra. In mutual love, God communicates a longing for relationship as key not only to God in se, but also as key to our knowledge of God and to our practices of being God's own in tangible, inclusive care of and for ourselves, our families, neighbors, friends, and communities. If we return to my room survey and apply it to our church gatherings, I suspect a sigh of relief by some and a discomforting surprise by others at the diversity or lack thereof of worshipers present in the gathering. Insofar as church participation is voluntary, where a diversity of people is present, their inclu inclusion holds sway in the community. Where diversity is lacking, there the community would need to interrogate its unexamined practices that fail to attract the local people of God. In the reversals present in God's economy and Jesus' example, the radical nature of the early Christian communities emphasized inclusion. We have good reason to believe that no one was turned away from the assembly, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. Professor Cahill has been instructive for a rendering of the inclusive body of Christ. Jesus' Jesus's re revelation evokes, I quote, evokes an inclusive response in which the disciple recognizes the humanity of the other across social boundaries. Moreover, she instructs, Jesus' open table, a precursor to the celebration of the Mass, quote, involves specific positive practices of invitation and inclusion. She notes, the entrances of the community were hardly closed, as in not closed. <laughs> Social contexts. The symbols we use to distinguish our social space from another function to unite or to divide, to integrate or to separate, to include or to exclude. The social dynamics of people and place are affected, if not determined by, the symbols that surround and inform the gatherings. For example, the symbol of the cross suggests Christianity and may signal prayer. The symbol of the bald eagle suggests the United States of America or Boston College or the Washington Nationals baseball team and may signal pride or victory um, or defeat. <clears throat> um, <laughs> sacred and profane symbols, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more symbol. The symbol of a checkered flag, betraying my love of auto racing, um, suggests competition and may signal victory. Sacred and profane symbols both function to liberate or to oppress, to gladden or upset. For Cahill, I quote, fostering gospel-informed commitments and behavior transforms the function, of fam the function of familial and social symbols, leading toward compassionate accountability for the well-being of others and which requires the creation, of, the creation of effective, just, inclusive, and participatory social institutions enlivened by the spirit of solidarity. If we are to examine the social contexts of our communities for the accountability each of us has for others, following the lead of liberation theology's insights Cahill notes that we need to, quote, begin in the specific life experiences which provoke reinterpretation of both the Christian message and the function of Christian community as a catalyst in society, end quote. The community functions like the symbol of God functions to re-socialize a community in the light of Christian commitments. Thus, our interactions must in Cahill's thought, point to and, quote, serve the common good by enhancing the participation of the least well-off, enabling all to share in the responsibilities, rights, and benefits of society, close quote. Unfortunately, the ecclesial and social families to which we belong, where we are included 
as a location for the Christian call to solidarity and praxis has been relegated to the realm of the personal, where the political and social ought to be engaged. Cahill reminds us of the social dimensions of our call beyond the nuclear realm, quote, to make Christian moral ideal, the Christian moral ideal of love of neighbor part of the common good. Close quote. As such a love is part of our personal good and the ability or likelihood for any one of us to thrive. The challenge for each of us is to interrogate wherefore diversity in our personal and communal space is present. As we have inherited the tradition of the common good and understand it to, sign to signal access to all those things necessary not only to live but to thrive, so must we become ever more attentive and proactive regarding the mismanaged access to the good that is sure to be found in inclu inclusive ecclesial and social contexts. Thank you.